All right, and we are on the air. Welcome to another Hangups. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Christopher Weber. Um, Brandon is, for those of you that have been around a while, Brandon has uh, handed off the reins, and I will be uh, taking over as the uh, primary curator of, uh, or host, I guess, of uh, Hangups. And uh, yeah, so this week we're going to talk monitoring and um, monitoring and testing and kind of wherever that ends up taking us, whether that's down the path of discussing tools like Sensu and Nagios and how you might want to uh, test your infrastructure that way, or things like server spec and RSpec Puppet and Chef spec uh, will head down that path. So uh, I guess we'll start with a quick intro for those that are here. Um, Bridget, all I've got is a red screen for you, but you want to... No oh, right. Say Tell hello. That. Oh, I forgot to take the EFF sticker off. <laughs> oh, you know what? For some reason, I thought that you were just putting it out on air. I was just clicking to watch. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. You should stay stay and join us and talk, with, talk <laughs> about this with us. But if you want to watch, there's another uh, link for that. Yeah, uh, no, I'm sorry. I, I clicked the wrong one, obviously. I wasn't trying to, like jump in or whatever. Um, I'll go look at actual hang-ups and jump on the right one. Okay, sounds good. See you guys later. Okay, and then Joshua, you want to introduce yourself? Not really. <laughs> okay, I will. I'm Joshua Timberman and I work for Chef Software and I do operations and uh, cookbooks and development stuff. All right, and Paul? Sure. Uh, I'm Paul. I work at uh, Rackspace as a, I guess, a sysadmin uh, doing OpenStack related things. And how about you, William? Um, I'm a uh, site reliability engineer at a startup in Redwood City called It's On, um, and I'm just here to listen to hear what you guys are talking about. Sounds good. Well, feel free to jump in at any time. So I guess the, the question becomes, do we want to start down the path of talking um, monitoring tools? Do we want to talk testing? Like, to me, testing seems a bit more interesting at the moment because I think it, A, I think it's less of a solved problem, if you will, and I have this theory, and I may be crazy, but I have this theory that a lot of the things we're doing in the testing realm of, like, testing our config management stuff is going to end up bleeding into very soon here uh, the type of of a monitoring we do. Any thoughts? Nods? Okay. So I guess I'll start off. Um, I'm guessing, just knowing the group here, we're a little more chef heavy than puppet heavy. Um, but ha has everybody played with server spec? You guys seem to have a problem using this. Um, yeah, I was using it earlier today, in fact. <laughs> Me too. What do you know? Uh, I, so, okay, I guess we'll start down my crazy theory. Is it crazy to think that we are going to get to a point, a, a get to the point where the server spec tests that we're writing and including in our cookbooks and including in our puppet modules, like, those will eventually end up somehow in our Nagios or our Sensu checks? Absolutely, and I think that's already starting to happen. At Monitorama early this year, there was a lightning talk on someone talking about exactly that, um, running their service spec tests using Sensu. Yeah, I, I can see that, but I think that there are, are some folks that are probably interested in going the other way and running their monitoring checks uh, in server spec, right? Like you can, or, or BATS or whatever your favorite uh, automated testing framework is that, that runs out of band of a CM tool. I've thought about doing that, and that would be like, that would be killer, and I was never able to find come up with a good way to do it in my puppet modules, but I had this like idea that, so what I was doing was I, I had exported resources for like my Nagios code, so it would go in and it would check if a parameter was set on the, the class, it would export the Nagios resources. I almost wonder if there's a way 
And it would. So first off, I guess, uh, and the, I'll ask you straight up, Joshua, because I'm curious: is what's the right pattern for that in Chef? Because I've got uh, some thoughts, but I don't have opinions. And um, on the flip flip side of that, what's the um, like, is that a crazy idea, like, in from a puppet perspective, to go and... I guess you would you could do something crazy in your test harness where you watched for the exported resources, instanti- built your own catalog, instantiated them, and then ran them against your box. It, yeah. uh, I, don't, I don't know anything about puppet uh, as far as, like, the words... You, I, I, I recognize that you used a bunch of words that have to do with puppet, but I haven't used it myself in... A few years, so I don't, I don't know like the the puppet way of doing those things. So, but what's the chef way like that? I, I get that there are like a couple of options here, but if you were implementing tests, do you include those tests as part of your cookbook, or do you? So, okay, let's be a little bit more prescriptive in my question because otherwise we'll do a lot of yak shaving. Um, I've written an application cookbook that lights up. Uh, and, and a an Apache thing, you know, something running Apache. It's just this Rails app, okay? Mm-hmm. In concept, I could just include the Sensu checks as part of that cookbook, or I could do something crazier, like as part of my global Sensu cookbook, it inspect the resource collection and see that that application cookbook happens to be instantiated, and do a thing. To instantiate the um, the checks. Opinion, well, thoughts. Uh, as far as the execution of monitoring plugins in, say, server spec, one one would presume that you would have plugins that can that can be run standalone without having to have a server set up. Uh, okay. For example, NR, you, you'd have NRPE uh, and Nagios checks, and you could run your Nagios plugins that way. Um, I believe that Sensu can do the same thing. It's just a little tricky getting the execution environment correct. But there, there are chef recipes for both of those things that you could include as part of your node convergence that ensures that the, that the plugins are installed in a place that the that the post converge checks could run. That would be in the same kind of place that they'd be if you're building your infrastructure. This is part of your real infrastructure. That makes sense, and I. So in concept, we could just like taking this to its logical conclusion in the chef world, we could write a busser that like said go check to see if the sensu checks pass. Yeah, I mean you you could write a new busser, but if you like server spec, which I like server spec, so I would probably just use that to execute the commands, because server spec has the described command, and then the full path of the check, its standard out should return whatever a, an OK response is going to be, which I think is just going to be like a JSON response that has OK in it. That makes sense. So for those that, that are listening or watching that don't know what a buster is, that's part of Test Kitchen. When you use Test Kitchen uh, for testing, say, a cookbook, you can specify a test suite to run using server spec, bats, uh, and there's a couple others, and those are uh, installed on the node and run on the node uh, after the chef run is complete, and uh, it'll execute server spec or, or, or bats or whatever in those tests. That makes sense. And I, Oh, I guess... hold on. We have a thought leader. Uh-oh. We're in hold up. <laughs> <laughs> well, and... So actually, as Pete joins, I have this moment of one of the things that I've talked a lot about from um, the perspective of testing and, and monitoring that we don't do enough of. And In fact, I was talking actually with some of the folks at One Health, but I'll kind of point out what I'm talking about first. Um, the idea of as we write our cookbooks and we write the, our configuration management, as part of that, we should also have tests that test for security things. Like, I gave a talk at PuppetConf a year ago, year and a, oh, almost two years ago, it feels like. Um, no, I guess it would be a year ago, uh, talking about 
testing in RSpec Puppet, and I always struggled with a lot of the unit testing type stuff in config management because it just it, it feels like I'm just rewriting my manifest or my cookbook. But I always like liked um, expanding it to do check for things like you know d is SSH doing something stupid like I'm you I feel like I'm a Californian I'm using like way too often, but checking to make sure that it actually disallows root login, that it actually does those things as opposed to did I add the SSH service? Yeah. Um, yeah, actually when I saw you guys were talking about, you know, monitoring and testing and stuff, um, these are these are relevant tingled? to my interest. What's that? Your ears tingled? Yeah, exactly. Um, but no, this is relevant relevant to my interest because uh, you know um, you know, being at you know this company ThreatStack now, we're so we're in a closed beta right now, but we're building out um, you know, kind of the the new infrastructure for um, you know general availability. So we need to get a lot of data out of that, and we you know as we build it, we want to make sure it's tested in some way. Um, but also, like we're you know we don't I don't know I don't like to call ourselves a security company just because I think there's so much operational value to the data that we can kind of display and show about you know, who's doing what when. Now, uh, granted, you're, you're a company that operates in the security space. That's true, yes. We operate in the security so, space. So but... if you're in space, then you want security. <laughs> exactly. But honestly, like, the way I look at it is, you know, the, the right type of people who would want something that we have, those are, like, that three- to five-person ops team. Maybe you have about a 1,000 servers on AWS. Like, what are the odds that you have a dedicated security team? It's zero. I mean, your company probably can't afford a dedicated security team or person. So, um, but you know, when it comes to that, you know, as we build this stuff out, it's like, well, we, we want to make sure we're building something, you know, pretty secure because um, you know people trust us, and we want to make sure that we really lock stuff down. So we we're actually going down kind of the security rabbit hole. So you know, we actually use our own tool to monitor our own tool. It's like. Using threat stack to secure threat stack while you yeah stack. It, it's like using Chef to build hosted Chef so that you can use Chef to build your open source Chef server to wait sorry <laughs> well so. we have that with supermarket right like where supermarket uses supermarket to get, to get its the cookbooks <laughs> that are used to build supermarket, supermarket. yeah that, yeah. Um, or, or as we were talking about in the Food Fight show yesterday with Chef DK, the Chef DK uh, has a Chef command that has a generate subcommand for generating a cookbook project, a, uh, a repository project, and so on. And it uses Chef recipes in order to do those generating things. I thought that so, output looked familiar. So Chef uses Chef to build cookbooks so that you can write code that will be run by Chef. I guess you could use Chef Generate to generate a generator. To <laughs> the inception is strong with this. Uh, well, so the the security thing that actually, okay, I I've been to a couple of security conferences recently, and it, it it makes me sad because it's like you talk to these folks and that are really security focused, and you listen to the problems they have, and it's like, really? You know, if you just got your team to use Puppet or Chef or Ansible even, I mean, just one of these tools, you'd get so much further and could, you know, move to the next state. I mean, look at what you can do with Chef Analytics. It just pulling back all that data about what's going on in your infrastructure. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, as, as we kind of, you know, think about like who who are the type of people who would want you know what we're what we're selling. Um, we actually think it's not really security people, just because while like our stuff can tell you everything, it's it's at a it's a kernel level, you know, showing you everything that is occurring on the server. Um, but I always look at it like, well, I want to give my developers access to do stuff like the legitimate trust but verify. So what if I could set up like file integrity monitoring so that if someone touches a secret, then I get notified and I can just rekey my secrets? Or um, so I don't even think of it like from bad actor point of view. I think of it like you know how can I track what my everyone's doing? Or from like a troubleshooting standpoint, you know it's the classic like, hey, this thing stopped working. Well, what changed? Nothing. It's like, well, hey, I see you log in here, but then you su to root, and now I don't 
you know, the logs don't show what you did. <laughs> so what you do? It's like I didn't do well, anything. You, you did a sudo vi, and then when in vi, you did a colon bang, <laughs> <laughs> and then you set his size to zero. Um, yeah, exactly right. So um, you know, so it's, it's that kind of stuff that I always find is you know beneficial to know that, but. Um, but you know, yeah, in the in the you know continuous world, like how do you you know how do you ensure that when you make a minor change and you run Test Kitchen that like something doesn't get edited, so it like disables some core piece of maybe security that you have. So you know, let's say you have a two factor thing, and you know your two factor is is managed by an attribute that's set, but you make some change somewhere, and now you have a typo, and now that attribute doesn't get set, and suddenly all of your two factor just like looks like it's working, but it's actually not reporting up or something like that, right? So a really minor change could actually have this like global effect, and now all that security you spent all this time on is uh, is suddenly worthless. You know, it's like so. Then how do you like how do you like monitor for that and test for that? It's kind of like they they tie in, I think, pretty well together. So yeah, and one of the things I've been pondering a lot about is the. So, like, we talk a lot about in Docker, and I, I've been loving, uh, for anyone that hasn't heard it, uh, Matt Ray and Cote, and I forget the other gentleman that's on the podcast, but they've got a new podcast called Software Defined Talk. And, you know, Cote regularly talks about, you know, cloud and how it's stateless and all this other stuff. And that's, that's fine and dandy. Like, Docker's awesome for those types of things, but what if you've got, you know, your M4000 running Oracle with Puppet on it or with Chef on it, and, like, you run, you converge, and then you converge again, and you're, there's, like, there's state there. How do you test that? Because we don't... Like, Test Kitchen always assumes a clean slate. Uh, how do you deal with the fact that a DBA went in and mucked with this file, or how do you deal with the fact that, you know, what was, uh, there was a talk from the folks at Twitter, um, you can't, can't uh, chmod uh, minus, or chmod plus i with the broken fingers, you know, that idea that people will, will actively work to, not being malicious, but they've got to get stuff done and go and do crazy things like, Make a config file immutable on ext4 because they can. Chmod 777 considered harmful. <laughs> well, but we can fix that. But how do you deal with the fact? It, it, and I wonder. I know Puppet didn't handle this at, at years ago, but like that, you would, what people would do is they would go in and chmod plus i make that file immutable, and Puppet couldn't fix the file. So, which is where Twitter ran into problems. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like that, that, that feels like a, a not solved problem yet. Like the multi conver the converging your stuff after the fact. Like there's state, and it's magical. Well, right. That's my unmuted. Oh, yeah, I am unmuted. Um, yeah. So that's like the concept of like drift, right? Con config drift. Um, and there's obviously like a ton of companies out there that are trying to solve the issue around configuration drift of, okay, you define the state of it, you converge it based on your recipes and cookbooks and stuff, and then, or your puppet manifest or your Ansible, whatever's, you know, so like someone logs in and does something, now it's not the case. I mean, one way is, and I, I mean, I'm not going to say how, how, how are we going to solve it because I don't really know yet, but... I think a good way to solve that is to reduce the lifetime of your instances, right? But obviously for 95, 99% of people, that's like an impossibility because that, that says that you have really tight automation and you have really tested it over and over and over again. And for the most part, like, people getting started with automation have, like, you know, all this old shit that they're like, well, <laughs> now what do I do? <laughs> well, and what frustrates me is... is of course, the web front end, I can just blow it away and build a new one because it's a web front end. It's kind of sort of stateless. Uh, I mean, the problem is, is it, it's and it's the important shit, right? That like your database server ends up in this place where the my favorite example from uh, back in academia land 
you know, there was a V880 that sat on the floor that had PeopleSoft installed on it. And, you know, that was the campus financials. And to make matters worse, it used to be part of a Sun cluster and had been removed from the Sun cluster. So there's, like, this weird, like, you can't replace drives because the fiber channel driver is, like, they had, yeah. I, I think I just invoked a bunch of people's uh, PTSD. But you get the idea. Like, the boxes that need that, short loop the most because they're the most important like I need to be able to reproduce this box in the case of an emergency are the hardest ones to do that with and oh by the way they're the ones that when um, when your automation tool automates the wrong thing are the boxes that you get in the most trouble when they get broke so I, I that uh, to me that's where the, the problem is it's not the the stateless web front end, because I can automate those. It's the, the database servers. It's the places where we're storing state. That just, ugh. So one thought that just came to me as we were talking is you could, uh, you could have something walk your chef resources and create uh, config files for, like, uh, audit D and uh, tripwire and stuff like that to watch all of those resources and what you set them to be. And then, so if someone goes and changes that, so they change, they change a file to immutable, you should then pick it up because you told it to watch that. So it won't auto-combat that, but it will at least pick it up and be able to report on it. Well, and that that falls um, well into my thought process of, like, walking the resource collection and doing right. something with, like, Nagios or Sensu, where, like, we have this list of things that are on the box that we know about. Go do these other things. And welcome, Fletcher Nickel. I, I, at some yeah. point, we uh, mentioned Test Kitchen, and you appeared. It's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little drugged up. I kind of did something weird with my neck, but I will arrive nonetheless. <laughs> Very nice. Um, I feel like I should go back to the, the Food Fight Show's IRC log, because there were, like, random questions I had for you about uh, Test Kitchen and, and whatnot. Um, but thank you for the work that you put in on that tool. It is, uh, I, I know I speak for myself at very least in saying it has made my life better. Um, and I'm sure many others. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, that's, turns out that, that ends up being like a driving goal. <laughs> it wasn't at the outset, but that totally is. So, um, okay, I feel like I'm dominating conversation. What other things do we want to talk about, folks? Can, can I, oh, go. oh, I was wondering, could I ask just, and, and forgive me if this is uh, too far in, in left field, but um, you guys were mentioning, you know, uh, tracking config changes and whatnot. Uh, it, could this also be seen as a solution for uh, reducing overhead in terms of, like, change control documentation and processes around that? And so thereby you can accelerate how a team can work because they don't have, all that stuff is handled automatically for them and they're all in sync with each other? So I think the folks at One Health are actually doing this, where essentially as part of their documentation for their HIPAA environment, they're essentially they go into like staging or whatever that environment is, and they run through their chef recipes, and as part of that they have tests that execute that demonstrate that they are meeting their HIPAA requirements, and that document gets outputted as gets outputted and stored for um, auditors and can be used moving forward for, okay, staging does this thing. We verified that it passed the test. Now we can move on to production type thing. Yeah, I believe we've done one of those at Heavy Water as well, like a similar thing, and I believe it was for HIPAA as well. Um, yeah, basically writing spec tests to sort of be the, like, assertion for the, whatever the policy was. Cool. I'm, I'm also just thinking even, too, um, you know, as you're making changes in an environment and you want to communicate that to the group, um, you know, it can be done automatically. So then you don't have the thing of, well, I changed it and it was a simple change and I didn't think I needed to spend the time to notify everybody and then that's, you know what I mean, that's, that type of thing. Yeah. If, if you're using the, like, GitHub pull request workflow, that all kind of just happens by magic, right? Assuming you're that far down the um, infrastructure as code that you have 
enough sophistication around that to also have some CI CD in there. Really, a pull request is a change request to your infrastructure. Yeah, and I guess it, it would be then in the situation where you're not that far down that uh, paradigm and then you have manual one-off changes being made occasionally for, you know, not ideal situations, but because you have to. Well, uh, it's hard to stop those manual one-off changes happening anyway because you get into something, you need to fix it, and you may not have time to go through your workflow. So often you'll make that change anyway and then go back and change the chef cookbook that, to do that for you and then reconverge to make sure it worked right. And that's just kind of how operations is and that's where if you have like a an IRC channel or a hip chat or something like that, that's where you can kind of uh, work, work with that and then if you have a, a Hubot or some other IRC bot watching then you can use that to then send out notifications based on what you said. Yeah, yeah and I'm, and I'm thinking too if you had something that was monitoring file changes in addition to those mediums that require human human initiative, then if you had also something that's more like a canonical log, um, that would at least be a another safety net. Um, so someone could go back and say, "Yeah, someone did change this in the last hour." You know, even though they're about to probably commit it, you know, we can at least trace down something. You know, that was changed. I don't know. So the, actually, I'm going to put someone on the spot because I can. Uh, Joshua, can you pull the, that type of information with analytics? Because I feel like that neato tool you were showing off the other day can do something, did something like that, where it just was checking for the state of a resource change. Sorry, the, the specific is, get what from analytics? So basically, because in, in concept, you can tag a couple of files, or you could, as, a, as an organization, say, we want to know anytime Etsy resolve.conf changes. Mm -hmm. And, um, even if you're just pulling analytics every 30 seconds, um, you could, in concept, test that. Yes, you can get that information out of the reporting API. Okay. So uh, the, the analytics uh, is a general term for what Chef is building for our uh, the reporting stuff that's in Hosted Chef and Enterprise Chef right now, and then there's the action log stuff that was announced at ChefConf. Um, analytics is just kind of like a, a general catch-all for, for those projects and features and, and products. Um, so you, could, you can query the reporting API for, uh, for run data. So you can retrieve all of the runs that have occurred on a server, and you can go and retrieve all of the runs for a particular node. So you can say if node web1, uh, see if it has any runs recently that had a particular resource get updated. All that data is available within the run. Um, you know, and they, there's different uh, state attributes that are, that are noted and which action was taken when the resource was updated. So could you, in effect, almost create a, a diff between two runs? Uh, ish. Um, yeah. I mean, you can, because it, it's all just JSON data, so you could just, like, munge that to your heart's content. Or if you had a way of just, um, I don't know, like, displaying it semi-visually, you know, with you know regular spacing and stuff, so it would kind of look like a big-ass recipe. That, yeah. That, that'd be kind of interesting to see something like that. Um, to see like what ch what attributes maybe turned on the resource or what what was different what caused that thing to to fire. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, one moment. I mean that's my personal See, I can do this cool thing where I use technology to do things. I mean, then that would just it is the Whoa, that's cool. Oh, if I do this, hey, there we go. We can all just watch it. Yeah. Yeah. Moving my window around. <laughs> uh hmm. Oh, uh. Magic environment variables. There we go. So we can see from Hosted Chef 
I have a node called cask that runs chef all the time. Um, and if I take a look at the, the run ID, that, though I'm not sure what is in that run, so I'm not going to show it quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm going to verify that I don't have anything crazy in that. Yes, because this is being recorded and broadcasted. <laughs> Broadcast live on the internet. Yes. I mean, I'll oh, really by rotating credentials. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. We've got... It shouldn't have any because um, reasons, but... Yeah, there's nothing. That's why I'm using my personal system rather than our actual infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> so that run. So th this is all just using the knife uh, output formatter stuff to present, like if you do a knife right. node show or whatever, you'll recognize the nice cyan and, and all that. It's just formatting JSON data. So we can see that this node, um, th there's some detail about the run, like this is the run list that was used, here's when it started, uh, the run was successful, I had 387 resources and 11 of them were updated. And then uh, the run resources has a bunch of information about each resource that was updated here. So we've got, you know, I've got a cookbook Datadog because Datadog is awesome and I'm using it. And uh, then apt. And I th think that I've got, no, I only have one apt get update. I'm doing something wrong because if you're using the apt cookbook, shouldn't you have like 15 apt get updates run? For, no, I think, your vintage of version, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that the supermarket cookbook, which is like, oh. does that all the time, is um, a separate thing. Well, yeah, it's not using the apt cookbook. Yeah. We and that, that's a, that's a different story entirely. But as we can see, that um, you know, I've got Minecraft on here because that's the Minecraft server, and that the um, that the Minecraft ser run it service was enabled. Yeah, that's pretty cool. In this run. So, for example, the, the thing that Chris was talking about earlier that uh, that I did is actually on the supermarket infrastructure, we have an elastic load balancer running in front of it. And the elastic load balancer, uh, we want to know if there's any 500 error codes coming from the backend application servers. And in order to run that check in Sensu, we, we have it on a, on a proxy node that that runs the check for us. And that proxy node is what shows up in the notifications. <laughs> but that isn't the actual supermarket server that had, a, had you know, some problem. It's the proxy node that has a problem. And so I wanted to report back the nodes that had supermarket get restarted. So I, I used this data to, uh, to determine that out of the, the run resources. Wow. But so... You know, if, if we were uh, auditing our environment, we could say, oh, you know, uh, Java is having its uh, Java home set. Why is that? You know, is it because there's a problem with the resource or is it because there's a problem with this particular um, system or, you know, is somebody doing something, you know, somebody logging into the system, changing things manually and, and setting that? And then we can get, uh, I could go to this URI and get this uh, data about that resource. Wow. Yeah, it's and this is all built into Hosted Chef, so if you're not using Hosted Chef, you should. It's also an Enterprise Chef, so I guess you could use that too. <laughs> <laughs> As an add-on. But yeah, um, the reporting stuff is super cool. Um, and, you know, we can... You know, it's just, it's just JSON, right? So if I use the JSON formatter... You could see that I could just map the run resources in Ruby and, you know, pull out all the ones that had a type chef handler and a name chef handler Datadog or yeah. uh, a type execute and a result of run or, you know, all the various things. That's really cool. Um... I'm wondering, like, could you massage this into something where it's almost like a real-time feed of this so that you could, you know, almost have, like, like we're talking about, you know, a shared chat window 
or uh, you know um, IRC or something. You can almost have like a feed in your IRC that's showing, hey, I've detected this change happened in the environment, or this file has been modified, or mm -hmm. kind of real time. Yeah, uh, you could probably write. The, it, it might be a little heavy because um, you're you know you'd be hitting you could be hitting the reporting API quite often. Uh, the, the API does do, does pagination, so you have to tell it the number of rows you want re as results. Like when I do the knife runs list, it gives me back the last however many, I think that's 10 runs. I obviously have more runs than that. And the in hosted, the reporting, uh, the reporting service only stores, I think, three months worth of data or something like that right now. Um, so... You know those those details. You know could be heavy on the API, but the uh, another thing that could be useful for that is the action log, which I don't have set up right now. But um, that would show all the changes that happened on the Chef server. So we could see we could get like a a feed of cookbooks that got uploaded or data bag entries that were that were changed and have those get sent into some kind of notification system such as uh, sending those to, to HipChat, Slack, IRC, uh, or whatever. Cool, yeah. If it wasn't already clear, my favorite part of working for Chef outside of the swag is the uh, getting to sit in on the internal engineering demos. <laughs> Okay, so Fletcher, I'm going to throw a question out to you because it's been something that has been painful for me recently. Sure. Any thoughts as to where I might stick a thing to make... Um, like, if I, if I fail in my test kitchen runs because of a timeout, because of a cloud provider... Oh, um, yeah. Retry... Like, do a complete... Like, I don't want the test kitchen thing to die, but I just want to, like, re... I want to rerun that uh, test. Like, I want to do a, a destroy and then a test again if I start with the test, wow. if that makes sense. So would you want to... Um, at what stage would you want to retry, I guess might be a way of putting it. I guess... Well, it really wouldn't even be a, 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 verify, a test. It would just be on create. If I time oh. out when connecting to the, um, the node, be able to say, okay, well... Obviously, there's something wrong with this node. Destroy it and rebuild it. I see. Okay. So it's more around like the node being sanish, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That that seems to make sense, and that's something. Or where that's probably going? something. At least it can we can start to solve that individually in drivers, unless there's something that pops out around like yeah, some generic retry logic, and there might be. Um, because I know, yeah, boy, you name it. Like most providers have problems. <laughs> yeah. um, I haven't seen it so much maybe on the kitchen side, but definitely even just doing stuff day to day where you get um, 400, you know, HTTP messages from cloud providers uh, using libraries that should work. So they're saying it's your fault, even though it's their fault. Like it doesn't make any sense at all. But. Um, Oh, and I, I owe the folks at DigitalOcean a, a ticket because essentially what I was running into is something... It seems like... So if anyone is, wants to go take a peek, I've been refactoring all the tests in the Chef Client, uh, res, the Chef Client cookbook. Nice. And nice. as part of that, like, to do a full test run, it's like 80 or 90 instances that have to be spun oh at some God. point. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And that's been reduced in... So, like, the number of... The number of suites has been reduced, but we've added a few more platforms that we're testing against. Wow. But anyway, so I think I've run into this problem in DigitalOcean where, like, the node gets cre the, the, a node gets destroyed, a node gets created, it gets the IP of the old one, and it kind of oh. sort of works, but it doesn't, like, the networking gets kind of borked in the middle. Oh, man. So... I'm think and usually if I do a retry, like destroy that instance and retry building it, that instance I'm fine. But it's like they happen too quickly, and I'm doing so many of them. So and right now when you're doing the tests, I'm I'm assuming you're probably just doing the like kitchen test, all of them, maybe with the concurrency flag on. I so it's an interesting problem set because like mm -hmm. I stopped using the concurrency flag 
because it would fail and I wouldn't know which of the 90 <laughs> tests. <laughs> and I'd end up in this like halfway broken state where like cuz it it gets the exception and it exits. Is Right, yeah. And in concept, so that that's probably another bug, and I should probably write a ticket for that as well. Um, if you don't see tickets from me, you should um, throw things at me over the internet. <laughs> um, same goes for the folks at DigitalOcean if you're listening to this, and I haven't uh, created a ticket for you. That's my bad. Because um, you can't solve problems you don't know about, right? Um, <laughs> like... The so I th what happens with the concur concurrency thing, right? Is because I I'll just run them all at the same time, and right, and then something happens, <laughs> and then so one of the you know ninety test cases fails. Yep. Or times out because I forgot to connect to the VPN, and that's where my AWS stuff has to go through, or you know one, wow, and then yeah. it just bombs, and it's like which one failed? I don't know. <laughs> So would the, that be running, uh, doing that exercise in CI or the workstation or both? Well, I eventually want to get to CI, but I, sadly, at this point, I'm finding that my crazy runs are not consistent enough that I could yeah, put them okay. into CI. Yeah, so I guess uh, I was leading down that way because I, I still think that there's work we can do around the CI tooling so mm -hmm. that... Uh, you know, push to CI doesn't generate, like, one job. It generates, like, one per instance kind of thing because... Most of the CI, they know how to deal with dependent jobs and discrete logs and, you know, handling failures. So, because, yeah, if you have, like, 100 instances, what are the chances that at least one's going to fail? Like, it's pretty darn high, actually. <laughs> it might actually happen all the time. So at least those, even if there's flaky transient problems, at least knowing that there's, like, two of them and you can rerun those and then you're good, that's at least better than, yeah, you're right. Turning concurrency on and walking away from 100 instances that are all in the cloud... Um, might not be as stable as it could be, which says a lot about a lot of things. <laughs> and well, Test Kitchen is the first one, but then, then we've got, like, the cloud provider APIs and race conditions there, and, yeah, it's kind of interesting all around. Well, and my long-term goal, I mean, because, so, the, I, for me, the other blocker of CI becomes the y kitchen YAML gets parsed, and I, I feel dumb for even... Like, I asked about oh. it on Twitter, and then yes, I went I and looked camping. at it. I was camping when you were talking about this, I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to do this on my phone. Yes, I, I, I owe you some follow-up on that. <laughs> well, the funny part is I'm asking, like, hmm, how do I stop this from happening? And then I realize as I'm going through my kitchen.yaml files, my if you go look at any of the kitchen.cloud.yaml files, they actually use... Um, <laughs> ERB interpolation because that's where the creds come from. Right, yeah. <laughs> so I have this like crazy idea that I just, I've got too many things going on all at the same time, but this eventual idea of basically loading Kitchen as a, as a library mm -hmm. and then just firing off each of, and then, you know, building that YAML object manually. Mm-hmm. Like inside the 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 essentially inside the CI pipeline. Yep. I've got a wrapper script that builds that and pu and it pulls the credentials from um, in a more controlled manner. Yep. And mixes them in, kind of thing. Exactly, and then um, builds the YAML file and then calls the things. Because so actually, it, what what you're describing is exactly how I envisioned a more like uh, appropriate fit CI pipeline. Um, which, yeah, so there are some features in the library code itself that you can disable loading, like local and global YAMLs, you can disable ERB stuff. Right now, it's not really supported anywhere. Um, it's, you know, like it's in code because uh, you can also write your own um, kitchen loader. Like there's only one loader right now, it's the YAML one, but it's mm -hmm. basically like a Ruby object. You create it, you call read, and you get a Ruby hash back. Um, and you can give that you can basically plug in a new strategy. So that was, um, yeah, that was me leaving, like, uh, an opportunity down the road to maybe have an environment, a container, where you can load in user-provided um, kitchen YAML. Mm -hmm. Don't do any ERB loading so that you don't evaluate, you know, their code. Mix it in with maybe uh, your CI cloud provider. Like, if, if you know, like, this CI pipeline is using OpenStack and nothing but OpenStack and it's going to use the CI credentials, it can take that, maybe load all the results into a database. So maybe the 
it gets saved to a database, and then when the uh, when the actual run happens, you don't have the YAML loader. Maybe you have a database loader or something like that. Oh, so you can at least like you can do all your possibly dangerous YAML parsing in like one place that's like cut off from the internet. You know, put a big circle around it if you're scared about it, so that you just get raw data and you put that somewhere else, so that it's maybe safer and more consistent on the other side. Um, oh, exactly. I, that's the place where I'm at right now, where I was thinking it would be neat to just go load the YAML file without doing any ERB parsing mm -hmm. and gut the 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 front matter that would normally have the keys in it. Oh yeah. And re-add that to the hash. Yep. And then pass that along. Yeah, exactly. Or you know, or actually parse it and ver you know, pull it in, verify that there aren't stupid things in there, and then you know that type of thing. And then at that point, you can do fun things like execute multiple CI jobs, that type of thing. Yeah, and um, I've got a uh, maybe a two hours worth of work. I almost have the code in a place. So right now you can call kitchen list with like dash dash bear, and you'll just get like just the names, no no like porcelain around it. So you, the idea was like you could call something, generate a list, and then for each of those things generate maybe a CI job. Um, the problem right now is it still loads all the drivers and everything, but mm -hmm. I think I can get the library so that it, I can maybe make that loading lazy. Because what I want to do is like have a command you can run. All you need is test kitchen core, and you don't need any drivers. It'll just give you the list of the names so you can construct like mm -hmm. dependent CI jobs. That seems to be like that's one part of the puzzle for for this thing, and that's why I haven't gone off and spent a week trying to write a, a Jenkins plugin for it yet. I, I'm actually surprised no one's done that yet. <laughs> I, I think we're all... I, I know it's on my long list. I just have a long, <laughs> long list. Yeah. <laughs> it's, been, it's been interesting just playing with it and kind of poking at the various things you can run with Test Kitchen and, yeah... It's exciting. It works. So you do bring up something that I've often struggled with. Um, so the default behavior for Test Kitchen is to crash as early as possible so you get your feedback quick, um, which is kind of crappy when you're doing that, like, 100 instance one, and, like, you know, one of them dies, and the whole system's just decided to be designed to stop right there. Um, I've often wondered, maybe is... They're like a mode where you want to be like, just like run everything else to completion so at least you can get um, a checklist at the end of like what things you need to look at rather than the first thing you need to look at. Um, yeah, because, you know, you, you might be working on a cookbook and, you know, it, it crashes midway on the third platform out of five. Yep. And, all, and, and you still want to test the other two. You're right. like, I don't want to stop here. What if I know that it's going to work on the other two, or I think that it's going to work on the other two, and you know, I w at least want to at least wanted to try. So, and I know that like the RSpec library has flags for like fast fail. I mm -hmm. that might not even be the default behavior. Um, so there's other tools that have that trade-off of like run everything to completion or just die as quickly as you can. I hadn't really thought of this use case because. I suspect you'd use this all the time when you're taking pull requests in. Like you're taking somebody else's code and you're trying to just run it against regressions. So mm -hmm. um, you don't really know how many are going to fail because you haven't maybe looked at that code too much. So it might be more useful to say like uh, two out of six failed rather than the first one failed and you don't know if you have a lot of work or a little work to do. Oh, and that's yeah. exactly it. Like what, I, <laughs> what I've been doing is I, I wrote a little shell wrapper called Kitchen Tmux. Um, oh, yeah. oh, cool. <laughs> I can guess what this might do. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's just say I found the um, the number of file handles you can have open in... Um, oh, my goodness. <laughs> in, in OS X. It wasn't fun. Um, wow. But, yeah, essentially it just loops through and cr it, it, it loops through, opens a new... Uh, so it creates a new session <laughs> called cookbook name dash TK. Oh, yeah. Not to be confused with transitional kindergarten. Ah. And then um, creates a new window for each one of the tests <laughs> and runs it. Wow. And then I, awesome. with the chef client, I actually did. I went one by one to each test and wrote whether or not it failed. Because, like, so from, 
like in I in an ideal world, there would be like a matrix option where yeah. right. it it sets concur- concurrency to um, Ooh. by default sets con- concurrency to max or you know to whatever it's defaulted to, mm-hmm. and then it just returns a matrix of what passed and what failed. Right. Just like so that, this uh, is something I think that Sean Porter that was feedback from maybe the first time I talked to him from like week two of writing the Jamie code is having some kind of like results report or something. And that still hasn't really happened. Um, and for a while in the early days, that was something like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get to that. And now I've probably completely forgotten about it for a year. And that would totally be useful, wouldn't it? Um, about for the me. only way you can get any sense of what's going on, I think, is to look at the uh, either the per instance log files or... I know the like the the main um, kitchen log shows you it's a little bit higher level about like um, what the major actions are on all the instances, so you can get sort of a sense for what's progressing. Mm-hmm. But still, when it just crashes in that like concurrent mode, it's it's a little too impossible to figure out what exactly's gone wrong. Which is, um, and that's why we'll try to steer people at least on the CI side to having a bit more sanity, but. That can still be problematic on the dev side too, and yeah, I think in in when you're writing the code, you might know what you're going to expect quicker, or when it fails, you probably know what the bit of code is, so you can like step mm-hmm. back. But taking somebody's pull request is sort of a whole other ball game. Of, um, you kind of expect it to fail. <laughs> I don't know if that's pessimistic, but like, even my own code, if I haven't touched it for two weeks, I actually kind of expect it to fail. If it still runs, I'm I'm mildly surprised. <laughs> Well, and and that's exactly the the case, right? It's not that I even expect it to fail. It's just I've got a huge number. Like the first thing I do when I, anymore is I go through and I look at the cookbook and it's like chef client. Oh, hmm. I should be testing against this platform, this platform, this platform, this platform. <laughs> okay, that's there. Ah, oh, crap. <laughs> yeah, the so, exponential growth there is pretty crazy. Yeah, we've gone from testing like zero to like. 400. <laughs> well, yeah. the, the, the barrier to entry on testing things has gotten so much lower, though, um, because just doing a kitchen in it and having the default recipe be convert, be able to converge on, you know, one or more platforms within five minutes is amazing. That, that is already cutting some of that down, yeah. I mean, so, I, yeah, I, I, think, I think that's probably where I spent more time focusing is on, at, the, at the start and in the in the process of like writing the code and testing it, but there is that sort of like, and and then the and then the CI case, which is ideally like every instance has its own dependent job, mm-hmm. which is not what I think most people are doing yet. But that's because there's still I think there's still work to do. But there is probably another mode, which is sort of the the merging and taking pull requests, like the maintenance mode mm-hmm. of taking integration of code that you might not know too much about. And that seems like, yeah, you're right. I think that's like another behavior that I haven't thought enough about optimizing for. So stuff like having an end report, having it run things to completion and not failing fast, like those would, I think, optimize that case. Would that sound right? I'm putting myself yeah. in maintainer mode, and I think that would make me a lot happier. Exactly. And, I mean, let's face it, I always laugh because it, we have the conversations internally. Chris, you're new to Chef. Uh, how is your... Uh, you know your process going, and it's like, well, right. I'm not really writing cookbooks. I'm <laughs> maintaining cookbooks, which, to be fair, is a lot of what sysadmins do, right? It's, you know, because there's essentially I see two use cases for this. I see use case number one being like my problem set of I'm maintaining multi-platform cookbooks, mm-hmm. or the sys the sysadmin working at a company. And the first thing I want to do before I use this cookbook is I go run this battery of tests and get a report back to what works and what doesn't work. And maybe, you know, maybe I swap in my images that make sense to swap in, but I'm running these battery of tests and I just want to see what passes and what fails. Right, like as a starting point, like how good or bad is this right now? (laughs) Exactly. So... With that said, guys, we're getting close to the the top of the hour. 
Um, is there anything that we haven't covered that people want to jump in and ask questions about? For those if you're using Chef, on... use Chef DK. I, I will plus <laughs> one that. Because it, it has all of the all of the tools built in for doing all the things we, we've been talking about I, as far as Chef goes. Obviously, Chef DK isn't going to work out for people that are using uh, Puppet since it doesn't have Puppet in it. But I guess you could use it. You could totally install it, though. Install yep. the Puppet gem. It'd be Chef install, Chef gem install Puppet. <laughs> yep. That's so crazy, I might just do that. <laughs> Fletcher, don't you maintain the Puppet cookbook on Supermarket? Yeah, I think Josh. I do have one. I, I now have <laughs> well, Josh, I be talking how, to Chris about that one. <laughs> how, is, how is this better than Hadoop is what I want to know. I don't think anything is better than Hadoop. They have an elephant for their logo, so or their mascot. You, you, I, can't, really, you can't really beat that. It's the elephant in the room, literally. <laughs> I feel like we're channeling Brandon, so as part of that, I want to point out, he actually released a, a new copy of the Zookeeper uh, cookbook out to uh, the supermarket this morning, so nice. uh, nice. plus one to that. No, like... Uh, from a Puppet perspective, yes, uh, you should be using Puppet Lint. You should be using Puppet RSpec. Apparently, there's Beaker. I have not had a chance to sit and play with it, um, but I'm hearing positive things about Puppet Test Kitchen as well, so I need to dig into that and play with it because I've got a talk coming up that I should probably get prepared for, and that That's would nice. be useful to know about. So I, I did get questions about that early on. I fully intended to like um, spend a bit of time and get some people around that. I think in the meantime, people have like started to solve that uh, on their own um, because I, I've 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 heard nothing but generally positive things um, about running it, which is uh, yeah, it's a bit surprising, but maybe it's not. I don't know. On that note, any word on when we're gonna see the uh, Windows support stuff? Land? Oh yeah. I had said uh, I want it by September, and uh, I don't think that's happening by Monday, but um, it's got to happen fast because... You know, yeah, September is just so needed. days long. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I wanted it, I wanted it like, out there by the 1st of September. Oh, yeah. Um, well, you have a like hard project. deadline, but that's, uh, that's maybe a little too hard <laughs> for the weekend. I'm waiting for... Um the folks internally to actually do a release of uh, Knife uh, EC2, but okay. I have uh, some just like Knife invocations that will stand up Windows instances in one hit for 2008, 2008 R2, 2012, and 2012 R2 on EC2, so where you can just, you know, Knife server create EC2 and add this user data, and you magically get Windows instances. Is there a lot of extra... Yeah, is, is there a lot of extra stuff that you need to do, um, like user data-wise or param-wise? Uh, it's just a single user data data thing where essentially you basically you have to turn off some, you have to mess with the firewall rules and you have to mess with um, like uh, the way okay. knife WinRM works still. Like you, it's not doing cert auth that has to do like um, un um, unencrypted auth, which like yeah. for my use case is pl plenty fine because it's all testing stuff, but yeah, do not use what I'm what I'm go my blog post that's coming in production. <laughs> to the point of I was like I got like I rage quit and added the PowerShell to just turn off the firewall on 2008 R2 wow. and 2008 because I couldn't like the invocation to add the rule wasn't working right. <laughs> hey, how do you, how do you use PowerShell to disable SE Linux though? That's what I want to know. That's coming out. Um to SE I think. I, you know, we should actually ask Steve because I bet you can do that with Azure. Just saying. <laughs> it may be a PowerShell call to an SSH call to disable SE Linux so that you wow. can install packages on CentOS 7. <laughs> so the, confu the future where everything like converges together. That's, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I am still committed to at some point in the next few months, and I keep saying next few months, but okay. I, I'm going to say I'm committed to, by my one-year anniversary at Chef, um, moving to Windows as my primary, like, workstation for at least three months to, to kind of feel that, that experience. Because I, I think that it's important. Although it's crazy to see how often internally um, during demos we're seeing people running Windows boxes doing awesome things. So 
I bet you the longer you delay that experiment, the better your experience is going to be. Right? <laughs> I so, would agree. I'm delaying mine indefinitely, and that's worked out pretty well. <laughs> All right, everyone. We, we well, do we do have some windows internally for uh, like AD and that sort of thing, but uh, yeah. No, I think it's like it's actually like, and I say that I, in as positive a way as I can. I think it's getting way better, at least on on the chef side. Oh yeah. I would. So totally all you gotta do is wait because people are doing awesome stuff <laughs> in the meantime. Exactly. All right, everyone. Well, we better call it a day. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us, and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, that. Yeah. To uh, anyone to doing this some more. Uh, we'll see you all next week, hopefully. Thanks, Bye. guys. Cool.